This video is a review of diatomic molecules in quantum chemistry. We start with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which says that the kinetic energy of nuclei is zero, that is that the nuclei are fixed in position, and the wave function that we're concerned with solving for is the electronic wave function, which depends on the coordinates of the individual electrons. We can solve separately for a nuclear wave function later if we want to, once we've solved for the electronic one, but primarily we're concerned with electronic wave functions or orbitals. The simplest possible molecule we can have is the hydrogen molecular ion, H2+, and the simplest possible basis set we can have for H2+, is having a 1s orbital centered around each atomic nucleus, uh, 1sA and 1sB. If we take this basis set, then we get two energies resulting from these uh, two different states, and we get that the numerator depends on matrix elements of the Hamiltonian and the denominator depends on matrix elements of the overlap matrix uh, depending on what those are at the value of the uh, intermolecular separation giving us a potential energy surface. In terms of molecular orbitals we end up getting a bonding and an antibonding molecular orbital. The positive linear combination psi plus builds up electron density between the two nuclei due to constructive interference, and this buildup of density leads to a bond, thus it is a bonding molecular orbital. And for the negative linear combination, psi minus, we have a depletion of electron density between the two nuclei due to destructive overlap between these two wave functions, and this leads to it being an antibonding MO. These molecular orbitals, when you have a diatomic molecule, are eigenfunctions of the z component of the angular momentum operator, LZ. So LZ acting on an individual atomic orbital gives the eigenvalue mh bar, where m is specific to a, a specific molecular orbital. And these eigenvalues that you can result in terms of m are 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, etc. And these give rise to classification of orbitals as either sigma orbitals, pi orbitals, and then even more exotic things like delta orbitals, etc. beyond that. In addition to classifying orbitals by their angular momentum eigenvalues, we can classify them by their response to inversion. The inversion operator takes a point and then returns the opposite point in space, minus x, minus y, minus z. If you are symmetric with respect to inversion, you are gerata or g. If you're anti-symmetric, you are ungerata or u. You can have sigma g, sigma u orbitals, and you can have pi g and pi u orbitals. Sigma g's being the bonding, pi, pi u's being the bonding, and then pi g's and sigma u's being anti-bonding. Um, building up the molecular orbital diagram for H2, now we have a hydrogen uh, molecule with two electrons. We have overlap similarly between the 1s on each individual atomic nucleus, forming a bonding orbital, a sigma bonding orbital, and a sigma antibonding orbital. And the two electrons fill up the lowest energy orbital first, according to the Aufbau principle, giving us a single sigma bond and thus resulting in a bond between uh, these two nuclei. Uh, extending this principle more generally about overlap of individual atomic orbitals, we have the LCAO-MO method, or linear combination of atomic orbitals for molecular orbitals, which kind of shows us in general how the overlap of any two given atomic orbitals will lead to uh, more involved uh, molecular orbitals, and the same number of atomic orbitals that you enter in is the same number of molecular orbitals which you must get out. And they'll, of course, obey some response to uh, this individual angular momentum and inversion symmetry as well for diatomic molecules. We can take the basis set of the 1s, 2s, and 2p orbitals for second row homonuclear diatomics, and we can build up an orbital energy diagram uh, for these based off of how they overlap and their, what their energies are. And we get this kind of structure which looks like this here. So we just fill up using the Aufbau principle and also Hund's rule about how we fill up orbital diagrams and just however many electrons that an individual diatomic has, that's how we would fill up this diagram here. So if we had 10 electrons, we'd just say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we would fill it up like that. To determine bond order, or how many bonds we qualitatively say there are between two atoms, we count up 
all of the bonding electrons, all of the antibonding electrons, and then we take that difference and divide it by one half. So every bonding electron, such as a bond, such as an electron in a sigma g orbital, contributes one half to a bond, and every electron in an antibonding orbital, such as a uh, sigma u star, star being antibonding, uh, contributes a half a bond away from a, a, the bond order. And then the total indicates uh, how many bonds we have, and we can determine from the orbital diagram whether they are sigma or pi, etc. And then, what, just as we did for atoms, we can classify electronic states for molecules using term symbols. And instead of having a capital uh, alphabetic letter for the angular momentum, we now have capital Greek letters as our individual orbitals were classified as sigma, pi, delta, etc. And then our total term symbols are classified by capital Greek letters like capital sigma, capital pi, and capital delta. And we have things like singlet delta, triplet sigma, singlet sigma, doublet pi, etc. And then additionally with these term symbols, we can tack on the total wave function symmetry with respect to inversion. Uh, gerata times gerata equals gerata, ungerata times ungerata equals gerata, and the any kind of cross multiplication, ungerata times gerata equals ungerata. And we get things like for the boron dimer, you get term symbols which arise such as singlet delta g, triplet sigma g, and singlet sigma g. And for something like helium 2 plus, the helium molecular ion, you would get doublet sigma u.